All right. Hebrews 11, and we're going to begin reading in the very first verse. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith, Abel offered unto the God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by the which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. And by it, being dead, yet speaketh. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Amen. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for an opportunity to meet with thy people here at Dover. God, we give you the praise for that. Lord, we thank you for the place that you've provided in out of the elements that we might meet and that we might glorify you comfortably and not all the disciples have had that. God, we pray this morning that you would meet with us. Lord, that you would stir the hearts of the saved to your service. And Lord, that you might even awaken a lost person and bring them to spiritual life, even this day. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, the writer, and I personally believe it to be Paul, but that is not really uh, proved by the Word of God, uh, writing to the church at Jerusalem. Now, the First Baptist Jerusalem had got into some problems uh, more than once. The first time, they didn't follow the commission. He said, go, and they didn't. Right. And then the second time, they began to, to add back some of their Jewish customs to what the Word of God teach taught, and it was nothing in it. In fact, one time, the Bible says Paul rebuked Peter to his face because of what he had done. And, you know, that's why I don't understand this new, uh, this new seventh day messianic Jew mo movement. It's because people had already been rebuked for it. But you see it growing by leaps and bounds every day. And I personally believe because they're either lost or they're very, very weak in the faith. Now, as Paul, or the writer, is moving toward the end of his letter back to the church at Jerusalem. He begins to make a great example of faith. Now, looking across the congregation this morning, I can't identify who's faithful, who has faith and who doesn't. Now, faithful is a little bit e easier to judge because if they're here and they're interested in the Word of God, and if we say we're going to meet seven times next week, you're here every time, on every day, you're counted faithful. But faith is a, is a totally different thing. I can't see your faith. I can't measure your faith. I can't look and say, man, he has a lot of faith about him. Because faith is not something you can see. However, and we will say we will see here that it does impact the life of believers. It does make them different than everything else. So Paul or the writer begins now. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The 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 matter, the the strength, the 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 item. That is what faith is, and it's what's hoped for. Now, you know, a lot of people, and I certainly would agree with them on this, there's not such thing as a hope so salvation. But listen, there's a hope in me that one day I'll be delivered from this yeah, mess. Yeah, right. uh, there's a hope in me that after I'm done here, uh, listen, I, uh, it's not that, it, that's not the end. I have a blessed hope I'm from here 
to there. And that is what this whole, and, and I would to God, and we'll see each of these examples, I would to God that my life displays that I have a hope that's not limited to the here and now. And the individual that we will read about, it impacted his life. Now, if your faith does not impact your life, I would look at my faith. I, I would evaluate it and see, is it really based on, on, on God or is it based on oneself? Because, you know, even in the example uh, that we have in Cain and Abel, the best I understand, Cain had a faith, but it, but it wasn't effective. Mm -hmm. Cain had a faith, but it was in the wrong things. Right. And so this morning, certainly we can have a faith and it not be placed in the right thing, not be placed in, 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 the, in the thing that God would have us to place it in. And, and so we find that we need to evaluate our own faith, and only you can do that through the help of the Holy Ghost. Now, faith is the substance of things uh, hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Again, I can't look at you and see your spiritual barometer and say, man, that dude is full of faith. But I can see what you do. I can see how it guides your life. I can see what you trust when the storm begins to, to rock and roll a little bit. Verse 2 says, for by it the elders, now this is not the elders of the church, it's the elders of the family of God, it's the patriarchs of the faith, for by it the elders obtained what? A good report. Now I understand in the modern day of the public school system that you get your, you get your uh, uh, report card emailed to your mom and dad. Now, it wasn't like that when I was in school. They trusted you enough to carry it home, and your mama had to initial off on it or sign it, and then you took it back to the next uh, six weeks come around. And you know what? When mom looked at that, she knew what I had been doing. She knew if I had been on the ball at school, and she knew that I'd been playing around with my buddy. She knew if I was thinking about arithmetic or thinking about what I was going to do when I got home, it was a report card, and it showed exactly what I'd done. And so we find that we can have a good report. If your faith is dri driving your life, I would say that you have a pretty good faith. And if your faith is not steering you along, uh, again, I would look at my faith and be sure that that is where it needs to be. Now he goes into some examples and of what faith will do. Through faith, we understand that the world's plural were framed by the word of God. Now that is a faithful thing. You know what? Uh, I, I've been to college for four years, took a few master's levels class, and I still believe to this day, at 52 years old, that this world was created in six literal days by the mighty words of God. He spoke it, and it was, and it still is, right. and that is faith. Right. I don't, you know what? I don't need, I don't need a geologist to tell me that I'm wrong. And you know what? E even in the modern day, and there's some very good scientific scientists out there. I don't need a scientist to tell me I'm right either. All I need is the word of God. I, that's all I need. I, I don't, I, I don't need uh, clinical proof. It's because I have faith that this is exactly what it says. It's exactly what I believe. Through faith, we understand that the world, and I personally believe uh, the old world before Noah, and the new world today, and the heavens above, all that world was, re was created by the spoken word of God. And, that, and, that, and that's how it occurred. That's how it happened. That is faith. You can tell me no different. So the things which are seen, the trees, the gravel, the building, the things that were seen were not made of things that, poof, do appear. Now, you know, people tell me that I'm an idiot because I believe that, but they want to believe that uh, chemicals came together and one cell was created by a chemical reaction and then everything we see today came out of that one cell. I put trust in what the Bible says. That's stupid. 
Right. Yeah. Right. You know what you tell them? Repeat it. Show me how it's done. Create a cell. Right. And then I'll believe you. Mm -hmm. You know what? Mm -hmm. They cannot do it. No. They right. can't be done. And so we find then that the Word of God is true, and I believe that. And I believe that in faith that God's Word says it, therefore it is true. Amen. Nothing just appears from nothing. Verse 2, by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Did Abel want to look like the big guy? I don't think so. Daddy Adam told him, after we sinned and messed up, something had to die. Blood had to be shed. We messed up, and God brought us back in, into fellowship by something dying. And you know what? Abel believed it. Mm -hmm. He had faith. And it wasn't just because Daddy said so. I believe he thought about the character of God and knew that God, God had determined it so too. And so what did he do? It impacted his life and made a difference in his life. And he did the exact same thing. And I personally don't believe that it's just because he was a shepherd. I believe it's because he believed God. Yeah. You know what? I don't go out and nurse people back to health to prove something about God. I just believe it. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Being a nurse, <laughs> it's never, you know, it's a little bit spiritually. It's the way I make a living. Right? Yeah. And, and so, I don't, I don't believe at all that, that Abel did this just because he was a sheep person, a herder. I believe it was because he simply believed God. And then we had Cain breaking up and coming along with the fruits of the field, which were never ever. You know what? They didn't cut out, uh, cut up a cantaloupe to to make them clothes, did they? In fact, if you look at that, what was the wrong way to do it? Leaves. Leaves. <coughs> so listen, Cain wasn't no dummy. Uh. He was very willful in this act. He certainly understand what, understood what he did, and he <laughs> did it exactly that way. And you know all that went along with that, and how that it ended fellowship. And but the real thing is, is that Abel was a man of faith. His carnality, his flesh, his being was just like his brothers, except what that he had faith. God spake it. So it must be so. Right. And that's what he took. That's what he took from it. Verse, we'll drop down uh, to verse 5. By faith, Enoch was translated. Now, much of my life I've heard, well, that don't happen no more. But why not? Why not? And I've heard it all explained. And I know Enoch was translated and Elijah was called away. A lot of people believe they'll, believe they'll be two witnesses in the great day of tribulation. I don't know that I really believe that. Uh, you know why it's translated? Because God wanted it that way. He, he wanted that way. And he was of the old world. It was before the flood of Noah. And he was of the old world. And, and God just translated him. He moved him from this life to the next without seeing death. And that, and that was an act of God. Now, let's, let's see what was different about his life because besides Elijah, we don't know anybody that ever went this way as well. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. That's it. He had a testimony. Now, to have such a testimony, I believe he had to have faith, and we'll see, and a lot of people won't point this out, Enoch was a preaching man. 
He, he was a man that had a ministry. He was a man that, that was faithful, faithful, had faith in God, and he was translated to a different place. Now, I believe the writer here uh, wrote this back to the church in Jerusalem to say this, listen, it's always been this way. Now, remember, in the days of Enoch, that was before, long before the law. And so they seen he even then a person's an individual man and a woman, or a woman's faith was extremely, extremely important. Now let's go back to Genesis uh, five, verse eighteen, and we'll look at this event in a little bit more detail. Gen Genesis five and verse eighteen. Genesis five. In verse 18, the Bible says this, And Jared lived 162 years and begat Enoch. Now, if you will, if you will read all the genealogies, and a lot of times we skip over this because it gets boring, and it, you know it's like saying my grandmother, me, uh, my mother, me, uh, my son, my daughter, and then my grandchildren. And a lot of that gets, I usually lose people on the bout when it comes to my grandmother. But read this stuff. It's important. It's given to our edification. It's given us for our knowledge. And so this brought all up to the testimony of Enoch. It all says pretty much the same thing. This person was born. This person was this old. He had a child. And why else? This person died. Uh, remember the prayer of Jabez? It was, uh, it was oh so popular, what, about 10 years ago? And everybody had a prayer of Jabez on the wall. And you know why that became so popular? Because in a long list of genealogies, it said that he prayed. <laughs> and so there's, there's things in there for us. Not, not that we can know genealogies, but that you can be that one person that sticks out like a sore thumb in a, in, in a list of genealogies that's just trash. And, and, and so we find then that this individual, Enoch, had a very regular dad. Now, uh, not many of you left in here, my, my in-laws and my wife, and maybe Adam, Adam remembers him a little bit, knew my dad. And you know what? Dad was a drunk. Dad was not saved until weeks before he died. He wasn't a pleasant, a pleasant person to be around. He called me a Bible thumper. He did not want anything to do with me. And you know what? I was well satisfied with that because I really didn't want anything to do with him either. And I'm just, I'm just being honest. That's more than most people would do. And his daddy, Jesse, was worse off than him. I've heard, I've heard testimony. That there was 11 of those young, and dad was the oldest of 11. And, and, and her dad told me about they, they lived in a shotgun house, which means you can shoot from the front to the back and, and right out in a little coal mine town up in West Virginia. And Jesse would get so mad that, that dad would be escaping the children out the back window before he went into a rage with his gun. That's a stinking bad. You know what? About as bad as you can do is point a gun at one of your children. That's about as bad as you can go. But by God's mercy and grace, and that's it. Here comes me. You see what I'm saying? And in this genealogy, we we find we find Enoch. Just people lived, they were born, they lived and died. They were born, they lived and died. That's all there was until we found this individual. And Jared lived 162 years and begat Enoch. And Jared lived after he begat Enoch 800 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Jared were 962 years and he died. And Enoch lived 60 and 5 years. Very young man for that time. And begat Methuselah. Now, everybody, if you know your Bible, know that's the oldest person that ever lived. And Enoch walked with God. 
after he began Methuselah. Now, a lot of people miss this. All it says is that he lived 65 and had his young. And then it said he walked with God. You know what? Not trying to read anything into it, but I have to assume before that young was born that he did. Yeah. He had some kind of, you know what? Your children will wake you up, and if they don't, you have a real problem. When, when you hold holding this one and say, my, my, oh my, I'm responsible for this one. It ought to wake you up. And maybe that was the case in Enoch's life, I don't know, but it just says after the child was born, it says then he walked with God. That that's the first mention of his testimony. That's the first mention of him serving God was after the birth of Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and he begat sons and daughters. And the days of Enoch were 360 and five years. And Enoch walked with God. Second time it says that. And second time it states that. He walked with God. What, what a wonderful testimony. If that's all they can ever say about you is they, that he walked with God. Now, there's going to be some difficult places to walk. It ain't all, it ain't all cherries and roses as this filthy world teaches today. You know what? Sometimes you're going to have to be, you're going to have to be pulling on oak pews, right? Sometimes it's going to be very, very difficult, but you walk with God. When the doctor shakes his head and says, hey, there's nothing else I can do, you walk with God. When you're looking at the, in the funeral home and that's your mother, that's your wife, that's your, that's your husband, and you don't know what else to do. Walk with God. Yeah. You know what? God will never lead you away from Himself. You ever thought about that? These situations in your life are not to drive you from God, it's to pull you closer. And that's what we ought, that's what we ought to do. So we find this individual in, in a boring run of genealogy that his testimony simply was this, that he walked with God. And he walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Now, you know, I've heard the foolishness of this world that he was walking with God one day and, and God said, we're closer to my place than yours. Come on home with me. You know what? That, that's dumb. That's stupid. I just took this, right? Took it away from Kenny. Fully my action. I didn't talk to the book, did I? He took it. I walked with God. And one day God said, you know what? I'm going to take you. Now that's sovereign, is it not? That's how God moves. Uh, and they didn't say, man, I want to I wanna be took. God took him. What, what, a, what a wonderful thing. And you know what? Uh, I, I love the next part because it shows the carnality of the world. It shows the situation that they lived in. And he was not, for God took him. And Methuselah lived eight, uh, and he was not, for God took him. And Methuselah lived a, a, a hundred and eighty and seven years and begat Lamech. Now, I want you to see, uh, they must have looked at, looked for him, because the only way that they could find out that he was not was that they looked for him. Now, people was dying then, right? It's, they lived a lot longer than we do, but they was a dying. And you know what? Uh, when I was a boy over at Cumberland City, it's probably 85 ish, 84, probably 85. There was an old woman, old maid woman. And you know what I looked about old, ma uh, old maid or uh, old bachelors and old women, they live a lot longer than we do. Now, Miss Effie Shuff was an old maid and she was 106 and hanging laundry on her own line, and she fell dead. That's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah. But you know what? Miss Effie died, and she went on to whatever lay before her. But this man, they thought, well, you know what? 
And he was young compared to the Billy. He know it's a young man, but something's happening to him. And somebody says he was not, because the word of God records it, right? And they hunted for him. And they finally came to this conclusion, Enoch's just not here. <laughs> he's gone. The Lord took him. He's, he's done. He, he's went home to be with the Lord. And so we find in, in, this, in this genealogy a man that's different than all the rest. And I've even heard it suggested that possibly he was the only saved individual after Adam. Now, I'm not going there, but I tell you what, he did have a good testimony, didn't he? And so we find, we find then that the reason that the writer referred him is because they knew what Enoch was. Now go with me to the little epistle of Jude, just before Revelation. Only one chapter if you divide it that way. Jude. Now, and Jude has a lot to say about everything. It has a lot to say about how sovereign our God is. It has a lot to say about how God detests sin. It has a lot to say about how we are to live as believers. And, and, and so it's it, it just chocked full of good stuff. Now drop down to verse just verse 14 for time's sake. And Enoch also the seventh from Adam prophesied. Now, apparently, in addition to all everything he was, in those times with God, he began to preach. He began to say, you know what? Our God is real. I met with him this morning. I walked with him. He was, he was there with me, and we were fellowshipping. And listen, this is just not sto some kind of story we heard from Adam and Seth. This is the real deal. He is real. You know what? We live in the day and age when you begin to talk about the realness of God. People look at you like you have six heads. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, you know, I, I never marvel at the ignorance of the Word of God today. And it's true ignorance. I never even opened that up. <clears throat> I won't tell it because, you know, I don't, I don't want to get this boy in trouble. But I'll get you to tell him after. This, this boy in his school was so ignorant of the Word of God that he thought there was a smiley face in the Bible. It was just punctuation. And that's where we're at, church. Reading the Word of God and not even understanding what it's saying. That's where we're at. Not, not even understand the value of the Word of God. And I believe that's what Enoch was preaching. You know what? I don't believe his son, Methuselah, was doing cartwheels. I really don't. I don't believe Lamech, his grandfather, was like, Man, you know what? You're right, man. You are right on. Amen. He lived in a day that was by himself, but he still walked with God. You know what? Wouldn't it be a wonderful testimony when you're dead that the only thing they would say is, I don't know much about that boy, but he walked with God. That, that's a good testimony, is it not? That, that, that's, a great, uh, uh, that's a great and wonderful blessing. So we find a man that walked with God, that was close to God, that was faithful to God, that had faith in the ability of God. In verse 14, it says that he was a preacher. And Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied or preached the, these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints. Now, I personally believe that this is referring to the catching away uh, when the Lord returns. And to give you an idea about faith, and I figured this up, listen, it's from the internet, I don't know how accurate it is. But, if I understand this correctly, that was 5,775 years ago. Not far from creation. And you know what? He believed it. He had faith in it. 
that one day the Lord's coming with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment, to bring, uh, to bring everything back into the line. And you know what? I believe the day that Enoch, to the day Enoch was taken, he believed that. Now, you know, another thing that has to be good in that and it had to be learned from Enoch's ministry was it was written down somewhere. He must have said it enough that they, that they remembered it. Now, I've told y'all many times, my mother's mother, we called her nanny, we didn't say grandmother, that's for northerners. And uh, my nanny used to say, Land of Goshen. It's something that surprised her, take her by, well, Land of Goshen. You know what? I didn't even know that was in the Bible until about 20 years later. I didn't know what the Land of Goshen was. But see, it stuck with me enough. She kept saying it <laughs> and saying it that I, that I knew what it was. So somewhere down the road, you know what? Enoch was crazy, but he believed God. Enoch did some crazy stuff and said something about some some 10,000 saints or something. <laughs> and it was consistent. And when he died, they kept saying it. They said Enoch may have been crazy, but I'll tell you what, we never found his body. <laughs> and this is what he said. That the God's coming. The Lord's coming. He's going to be. And he died in faith. 5,775 years later, here we are. Mm. And we can't even have faith enough if God says do it, do it. You know what? 52 years is a pretty short time. All my life I've heard he's coming, he's coming. Don't even remember the first time I did hear it. You know what? I believe he's coming. <laughs> I have faith that he's coming. And you know what? I may die like Enoch, and I'm going to still be believing it when I die. He's coming. Uh, He's coming. That See, and, and it's God in my life, so I want to alarm, and I want to tell other people, and I want to say, listen, this is no fairy tale. He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. Uh, and keep going. And then, listen, young men, uh, you too, specifically, when I'm gone, you keep telling people. He's coming. Enoch said he was coming. The revelation promised he's coming. He's coming. Just be faithful to it. And you know what? They'll think you are as stupid as they thought they was. But that's okay, too. <laughs> so, he tells them uh, that the Lord was coming. Notice it wasn't health and wealth in verse 15. To execute judgment upon all. Notice that doesn't say the rebels. It says all. You know what? That must include me, does it not? I've got some pretty embarrassing things to get that judgment on, don't you? Some things I'd rather not other people know about. But best I understand it will be. To execute judgment upon all and to convince all that, uh, that are ungodly among them of their ungodly deeds and all that they've ungodly committed, of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him, meaning God. You know what? Somebody wrote his whole sermon down, didn't they? He said, They're coming. He's coming. He's going to execute judgment. He's going to testify against ungodly men with their ungodly deeds. It's coming. You know what? That ought to make us concerned, shouldn't it not? That's right. I'm worried. Listen, by grace of God, I, 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 will, I will plead the name of Jesus and his dear blood. But you know what? It still scares me. It does. I'm just being honest. I was telling this boy the other day, he was coming back from Dixie. Talking about it then, I almost had a wreck when I was a boy. And circumstances weren't that good. You know what? I'll answer for that. I had a load of teens with me, and I was the one driving. I, I put their lives at risk, you know? I'll answer for that. He comes to execute judgment. So how's your faith this morning? See, because I know that 
that's in reality. I try to serve him. Now, I fail miserably. And you know what? I don't think that Enoch was top grade, do you? But he had a good testimony. Right. Enoch was made out of the same junk I made out of. Only thing is they were a little closer to creation, and I believe their bodies were stronger than ours. But the same bombs, the same sinful creature that I am. So listen, dear friend, lost people, you have no excuse. People hate the doctrine of election because it makes two truth. You're still accountable. Yes, he's the Savior, but you're still accountable. Everybody that has ever sinned is accountable to the great God. And I love that 15th verse. He said, they will all acknowledge him. You know what? You know what? Madam Marilyn O'Hare will bow down and say, yes, thou art God. Mm -hmm. Man, she's going to be sorry, ain't she? Mm -hmm. not gonna, that, that kind of sorrow is not going to do any good. The rich man, even today, still desires just a drop of water. That's right. You're right. That's right. Listen, That's right. eternity's a rough thing. Eternity is nothing like it is here. Mm -hmm. I ran the car line twice, and was it four times yesterday. <laughs> I lived in so different now. And, uh, they cleared off these two lots, and I remember when there were houses on both of them. And Mr. and Miss uh, Ed Brake, we called his wife Maldi. There is no indication that they were ever even there. Yeah. Gonna be the same way with us one day. Everything's gonna decay on our land. It's gonna be taken back, uh, and maybe somebody's spinning by. There used to be a double wide up there, I think, and just keep on going. So what's ahead is far more important. Uh, than the here and now. That's right. You know the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have faith, is it impacting your life? Are you more worried about the temporal than the eternal? I mean, Donna's trying to have a little work in her house, but it's not because I think it's going to last forever. We're just hoping it might last till we're done. You see what I'm saying? But I've seen people build like five... 5,000 square foot homes. I'm like, what are you doing for two people? You know what? They're showing who the love of their heart is. Self in this world. That's what they're doing. Uh, where are you at this morning? Is your faith in this world or is your faith in the Almighty? Is your faith in the here and now or what's worth what is yet to come? That's the measure of faith. You know why people get so caught up in this world? Because we can feel it and smell it and touch it and call it reality. When what really is real is further down the road. What about you? Are you behaving your life as faithful? Someone just full of faith and, and knowing, listen, there's something far better, far longer than this. How's your faith?